Hello, everyone. My name is Sujay Hajela, Senior Vice President and General Manager at Juniper, and formerly co-founder and CEO at MIST. Joining me today is Mark Silas, Vice President for Information Systems and Technology at MIT. Mark, welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, CJ. It's a real pleasure to join you today, uh, virtually here in the Hollywood Squares. It's a pleasure to be with everybody and uh, look forward to our conversation. Mark, we've been, you and I have been conversing as we have embarked on this journey together. And first of all, thank you so much for the opportunity, not only for the opportunity at an esteemed organization such as MIT, but also more importantly, what you, Marco, and the team have really done in helping um, move this journey forward. So as a world-renowned university, MIT, we are faced with unprecedented challenge of delivering a quality learning and work environment for your students, faculty, and staff. And this challenge is further amplified by the unfortunate pandemic. Mark, how are you addressing this challenge? Well, you know, one of the great things about working at MIT is we have uh, some of the best and brightest minds I think the world has to offer. And that also means we have some of the probably toughest clientele that the world has to offer. So that holds us to a pretty high standard in terms of uh, expectations. And I'll say, uh, you know, so that's just under normal circumstances. Uh, this past year has probably put us under unprecedented uh, circumstances in terms of expectations. And really, uh, information technology went from, I don't want to necessarily say a complementary part of our environment here. Obviously, there's a variety of research and academic innovations and everything else that take place here at MIT. But it's really become absolutely mission critical. It is our institution as we've kind of transitioned into this digital realm uh, due to the pandemic. And really, the infrastructure we have here and operate has become absolutely part of the mission. <laughs> uh, I've never felt, and my team has never felt, uh, more closely supporting the mission of MIT. Uh, this is the closest you know we've ever felt probably in my time here since 1995. And uh, coming as a young MIT student, and certainly through the years, I've never seen technology be a more important part. Um, but certainly as we've kind of gone through this, you know, really the expectations are sky high, and then we kind of entered this new phase. And as we enter this new phase, we had to, you know, first and foremost was health and safety of everybody. And I think everyone here, you know, joining virtually or otherwise, you know, can relate to that. Uh, keeping all of our students, you know, their families, our faculty and staff safe has been really top of mind. And so that's was the first phase of our transition as we kind of disembarked in March. And then we quickly, like most organizations, started to undertake the question of how do we get some semblance of our day-to-day -day institution back together again? and really started to think about how to get our classes online uh, for the first time. You know, we went from having, you know, so small number of selected large classes online, uh, for, you know, numbering 100, 200 uh, out of our 1700 classes to figuring out how to get another 1500 classes online in a period of, uh, you know, what's a couple of weeks. Um, and then figuring out from there, you know, once we had the curricula going and basic MIT functions up and running administratively and otherwise, how do you really go about figuring out how to get this research and this innovation engine that takes place here on this MIT campus? campus going again? And how do we do that safely? And that, you know, we started to embark on uh, as we started the summer uh, with the real expectation that we needed to have this up and going again uh, in a matter of weeks. Um, and that really led to our partnership. Uh, I remember approaching you and saying, <laughs> you know, we really need some capabilities in our infrastructure here, particularly in our wireless, which really is our most important infrastructure these days. It is the last mile. I know those people, um, you know, years ago could never imagine that happening, but we're here. And, you know, really we needed to do a level of instrumentation, a level of visibility, a level of information access and just real-time visibility that we never had before. Um, and that was really going to be an essential part of how we were able to bring people back to campus to monitor health and safety, density, all sorts of other uh, aspects of our operation. But MIT, as you would imagine, technology is the name of the institution. IT was going to be a huge part of our come back to campus safely strategy as we started to restart our research engine. And that's when I, <laughs> I approached you and said, uh, you know, hey, how about we replace our entire wireless infrastructure? And, oh, I don't know. Eight to 12 weeks. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Sujay is, you know, he's a great sport because when I said that, I kind of expected like, you know, a little bit of a shock, but, uh, you know, he was, uh, you know, incredible, uh, incredible partner willing to dive in and said, yeah, I think we could do that. And uh, between Sujay, his team, Sadir, uh, Tom, everybody, Marco on my side, 
it's just was incredible to see everybody kind of marshal together and say, you know, we're going to figure out how to do this because we need to do this to figure out how to get MIT going again. And this is really a foundational element to get MIT up and running um, and get that research engine going. And also, as we look to the fall term, as you well know, um, trying to get students back here in some fashion, not the 100 percent density we have, you know, normally, but in some safe semblance of uh, density that we could handle and also allow them to participate in those programs that you can't do virtually you know, building a virtual robot, you know, doing chemical experiments, those things you just can't do uh, over things like video conferencing. And so we embarked on that adventure together. <laughs> I'm happy to see that both of us are still standing, uh, <laughs> still smiling. So that's a good sign. Uh, but what really took place over that uh, time period was just honestly, it was one of the most exciting things that happened for us during the pandemic, just the level of partnership and support uh, for both of our respective organizations working together. I know I uh, pinged you a few times off hours and you did answer. And, uh, you know, it was just an amazing, uh, amazing adventure between our two respective organizations. And um, I can't think of a better partnership, uh, you know, that I've seen throughout this pandemic. And, uh, you know, they say relationships are forged through shared adversity. And just the way both organizations have kind of responded to this, I think, is one of the best examples of what is possible, even under the most trying circumstances. If you, you know, really put your mind to it and your heart to it, you can do anything. Mark, I mean, thank you so much for it. I, I, I mean, I, I agree. First, when we first started this conversation, like, yes, I had those emotions, as you were saying, really? <laughs> like, but, you know, you yourself said that time that Sujay, with things going on, the timeline, the the order of measure has changed from years to months, from months to weeks, and from weeks to days, right? And, you know, I was really excited, Mark, that as we embarked on this challenge, which frankly, both the teams took on to make happen, really what differentiated us was the vision of an experience first networking, the vision of, like you used to say, Sujay, I need complete visibility as to what's going on. I mean, you and I ask, both know that the amount of calls, video calls, which were run on your network were like, has never seen that, that volume before. But what I really liked was, as we said, we both, I feel the teams stood up to the challenge because that vision of experience first networking was there. So Mark, what, what's your view on experience first networking? And how are you enhancing the experience, not only for your students, faculties, and administrators, but also how you, as an IT organization leader, run your organization? Sure thing. Um, I would say we kind of very much like uh, the MIST team embarked on a journey when we really saw the cloud, you know, the last several years is really a game changer. Um, we really seen it as a game changer, not just in how applications are built or where they're run. I think a lot of people think of cloud traditionally like, oh, well now the application doesn't run in my data center, it runs in somebody else's and that's the cloud. It's really not. I think that actually, that's part of it, but I don't wanna sell it short. And I think that often gets overlooked, but it's a whole new way of looking at things. It's a whole new capability of tools and powers and just functions that you could never do before. And really, you know, for us, we've seen this opportunity as a way to really rethink not only our operation, but just our expectations and how we do things, really looking at it from the standpoint of there's things we couldn't solve before that we could actually try and tackle for the first time. You know, there's enough computational scale, there's enough computational power to do things that before because of constrained resources you just couldn't do. And so for us, I was talking to someone who was an early, you know, say the godfather of cloud. And I said, you know, now that we have this cloud, you know, approaching maturity, you know, across our industry, you know, what do you think? He goes, all of the way we've been looking at everything in the technology industry is about treating computation, treating storage, treating memory, and everything is a scarcity. So all the mentality of how you build things and how you design things about treating these things as a scarcity, you have an entire industry of people who were educated that way, who were built that way, who would need to change their thinking now. And he goes, that's not going to happen overnight. Um, so we've kind of embarked on this journey, but you guys did too. So you guys have kind of taken a look at what I'll say are some of the more vexing challenges about visibility, about performance, about really understanding what's going on on the network, because that there's a lot of information to crunch to figure that out, to get a holistic view of what's going on. That's a big problem. That's a, that's a big data problem. That's truly a big data problem, right? And so for us, you know, this is really probably the first time we thought we could actually try and tackle these experiences in real time, figure out what's going on. And so one of the great things about, I think what we've been able to do with the new platform and with the capabilities it brings to the table is we can actually see what's happening 
and we can see what's happening in real time. We can see where we have challenges. When someone reports an issue, we can actually look at it and see what's going on uh, for the first time. You know, we're not running around with an RF detector or something trying to figure it out. And uh, not that my guys didn't love doing that. I know they're like getting out to the field, but uh, it really, for the first time, it's like somebody turned the lights on. It really was. I mean, one of my engineers said to me, it felt like somebody turned the lights on. You could actually see what was happening. And once you have that information available to you, once you have that data available to you, you can do all sorts of things about how you optimize your operation, how you think about how to allocate resources, where you make your investments, where you need to make changes, all sorts of things that you just couldn't do before. Uh, I think I want to think of previous times spent doing some of this early generation wireless networking is kind of feeling your way around in the dark. I'm um, trying to, you know, make a change here and then maybe the complaining will stop. Maybe it'll get better. Uh, a lot of things like that, because it was just so much information to figure out what was going on and get a comprehensive picture that you couldn't do it. And for the first time with the power of cloud and the platform you and your team have developed, you can actually do that. Uh, so for us, it's allowed us to really change our operation. I'll be honest, like the number of complaints, the number of issues and the number of times remediation are the lowest I've ever seen them in my entire time here uh, at MIT. And it actually gives us an ability now to focus on where we need to make enhancements and improvements and all sorts of things that we just couldn't do. Uh, I'll be honest, we just couldn't. And uh, so for us, it's a game changer. I mean, there's no other way to say it. It's a game changer. And I think really trying to get above just this basic level of infrastructure operations, which I think is where our industry has been pretty much traditionally and starting to move up the stack in terms of how things are working, how things are performing, where we can make things better. We're actually moving our way up the stack in terms of, I don't know, Maslow's pyramid of network needs. So, you know, we started down here and I don't know if we're at self-actualization yet, but I think the good news is we're moving our way up the stack and we're now focusing on higher level problems that before we couldn't even think about because we were worried about all the things down here. So I think it's a huge step forward for us. Mark, I love it when you say, you know, you turn the lights on. Frankly, I say this for, you know, our teams at Juniper, you know, Sudhir, Tom, Wes Purvis, Jacob, working with, with your teams. What we are proud and humbled about is that through this partnership, we ourselves have realized how we can better that experience. You know, your team, having gone through what is possible, having seen what they were, how they were doing things before and how they can do things now, frankly, thank you so much. That's helping us better the product too. Mark, everybody, like we all know, you're extremely smart. Of course, MIT alum, what would you expect? Uh, at the same time, you've got a team which is dedicated, loyal, and runs hard. I mean, I think Marco doesn't know when it's day and when it's night. He needs something, he just goes after it. I mean, it's an amazing team and it's your leadership, frankly, which is uh, exu uh, you know, putting that forward. But something for your peers in the industry, what trends do you see shaping networking in the education sector in the near and medium term? Sure thing. Um, I think near term, one of the biggest things will be about how we pivot to a post-pandemic world. And I'll be honest, I hope that pivots sooner than later. Uh, I don't think we can all live like this. Uh, maybe for the next event, everyone could gather in person. That'd be nice. Um, but I think, you know, for us really trying to think about what's that pivot looks like uh, to the post-COVID world. And so how do we start to return to what will be a new normal? Uh, not a normal that we've ever had before, but a different normal. Um, how do we repopulate, you know, some of these campuses? How do we restart our activities? One of the things that'll be interesting for higher education is, I know the model is tried and true, so in no way am I uh, discounting the efficacy of the models we've been using. One of the great things that's come out of this pandemic, and I think you know, you can think of it as a bit of an experiment or a forced experiment, is to really take a look at some areas of the educational experience and how we can improve it um, in ways we probably never would have thought about uh, traditionally. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, I was in a young MIT student in the you know, mid 1990s, and um, one of the things you learn quickly if you're a student here is uh, if you don't make it to the class, if you don't make it to the lecture for whatever reason, or if you don't take good notes, you're going to have a problem. You're, you're going to be in trouble because if you think you're going to use the textbook, no. And uh, so one of the great challenges here was to really take that experience, which is a core part of that learning, um, is very much dependent on the student. And it's, uh, you know, the real efficacy of it's dependent on how good your memory is and how good your notes are, or, you know, partnering with others to get that information. One of the things that shocked us kind of coming out of this was the students loved the fact that this class information, this experience is now online. They actually liked it. There's an ability to do self-paced learning. Uh, you couldn't do that before. If you wanted to go back and review a concept or relook at how this was, you know, described or talked about in class, you can do that. 
Uh, but for the first time, people can do that. Uh, there's larger classes where you have 500, 600 people, which is large by MIT standards. I know some of my peers will say, well, you know, 5,000 is large. So I wanted <laughs> to put it in context, but for MIT, it's fairly large. Folks felt hesitant to participate or to raise your hand. It's hard to be the guy in the front row or the back row saying, you know, I got a question. And for the first time in this paradigm, people were actually able to reasonably ask questions through something like chat. And it actually also allows the instructor to get a sense real time of our people understanding what I'm saying. Do I need to adjust or relook at some of the things I've just talked about and give them, a, you know, some more detail just to get the, you know, uh, key themes or, you know, ideas home. There's, we didn't expect that. We actually didn't. That was something that we just completely didn't expect. And it just gives you a flavor, of the kinds of things that these experiences we've had these past 12 months will help us in the future. Um, I think how we return, from, you know, stepping away from education, if you look at just the general workplace, what does the workplace mean in the future? How does that work? You know, what's that going to be like? Um, it's probably going to be not the way it was, probably more hybrid. Um, but in what way? You know, is it going to be half the workforce home, 20% home, 80% here? I don't know. I think for every institution or organization, it's going to be a little different. Uh, but I tell you, it won't look like it did before. And so one of the great things for us is if you're in a constrained area like Cambridge or Boston, where well, real estate's hard to come by, there's a real opportunity by looking at the use of these precious resources, which is the physical campus. And is there an opportunity to refocus or reallocate more to the mission on the education and research side? That's, that's a game changer. And so I think those are real opportunities we'll be looking at. And the networking that supports it becomes equally important. So I think for us, the infrastructure becomes a key part of how we're going to operate these institutions in the future, because all the technology investments we've made over this past 12 months, they're not going away. They're going to have to get better. Uh, the expectations are going to have to get better. So from that standpoint, the expectations are just going to go up. And so I look at where we are right now and where we're headed to. It's just going to get up and get higher. So I think there's actually a lot of enthusiasm and excitement here on our side because it really has opened a lot of eyes about opportunities to do things we wouldn't have thought of before. And I think we look towards the future with a lot of excitement about what we can do there. Well, Mark, it's always very insightful and fun, you know, talking to you. Thank you so much for your time and your insights today. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's always a pleasure to talk to my dear friends uh, here at Juniper. And uh, honestly, I can't thank you enough uh, for your partnership and for your support for us uh, through this entire uh, pandemic. I know we asked in a lot of you and the team, but you guys have risen to the challenge and been true warriors, true partners, and uh, just true friends uh, throughout this. So for that, I can't thank you and your entire team enough, and I really appreciate it.